Because if I draw on the course, because some things we have to do dance lessons as well. Now, I don't know why, because it wasn't a musical theatre course. I think the tutor was just fed up with us at that point. He wanted to get rid of us for a couple of hours. So I did dance lessons. Look at me. Darcy and Bustle are out. <laughs> Like there, and the bloody pouting blonde Barbie girls are always stuck at the back. So when I did that, oh, sorry. When I did that, I had to wear um, a black leotard and pink ballet tights. I looked like an overcooked baked potato <laughs> with two raw sausages pinned to the bottom. <laughs> and I had my hair quite short in those days. Now it's too short to be put into a ponytail, but not short enough that the tutor would acknowledge it's too short to be put into a ponytail. So she must have spent half an hour scraping it all up, two stone of hair lacquer on, hair, hairspray, plopped it right in the middle. You know Miss Trunchbull from Matilda? <laughs> <laughs> That's who I look like when I did my dancing down. <laughs> <laughs> Looking the way I do, I really sympathise with um, Henry VIII's fourth wife, uh, Anne Queen's, because she's, she's a stereotypical looking wife, isn't she? But I've seen both I've seen them both I've seen both of them. I've seen portraits of her and she really wasn't ugly. She just didn't conform to the stereotypes of beauty in those days. Um, because she was quite dark and in those days, this was you know pre-fake town, you were too pale because if you were dark you were associated with peasant women who worked out in the fields. And as today, um, if you were larger, that, that wasn't appreciated either. Um, it wasn't like size zero, because if you were slightly round, it showed fertility. But um, if you were too large, of course, you were you know, weren't, you weren't popular with the men. Which I think is quite hypocritical if you've ever seen photos and pictures of Henry VIII. <laughs> By now, the size of a bus. <laughs> anyway, so Henry VIII, he sent his court painter, Hans Holbein, to paint a picture of the uh, Amethyst. And Holbein extenuated her best virtues um, and then sent the picture back to Henry and Henry thought, oh, that's a bit of that. <laughs> and then she saw in the flesh and thought, oh, I like her not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have done the accent. <laughs> and do you know what that makes me think of? Internet dating. Hmm. So, <laughs> what we've done is we've written Henry Gates dating profile. <laughs> <laughs> totally to my control. <laughs> if, after reading my profile, you decide I am not your cup of mead, <laughs> I promise I won't punch you down and chop off your head. <laughs> Insert winking smile. <laughs> and I like crowns, not I like eating clowns. <laughs> I don't like eating clowns or crowns. <laughs> maiming French people, maiming Spanish people, maiming Scottish people, maiming English people, skewering laws, pigs that is, not people who bore me. <laughs> Five foot two and five foot four 
in height, likes home cooking, capable of bearing sons, good sense of humour, virgin, non-smoker. <laughs> profile picture will probably be this one in. <laughs> so, imagine her shock and surprise when this turned up. <laughs> and this is another one who's really misportrayed in the media in my opinion. Um, I think the film and theatre makers, they seem to couple supposed ugliness with now, Anna Pleas, she was not stupid, because when she found out that Henry VIII wanted a divorce, she basically said to him, yes, you can have a divorce, because she'd seen what had happened to Catherine of Aragon, and she thought, well, that's not going to happen to me. And she actually got quite a good deal out of it. She, uh, she was given a pension, um, royal houses, and she was given presidents over all the women in the land, except for the king's wife and daughters. Those are not the actions of a stupid woman. And so... What we're doing in our play is we're going to have our actress read out the letter of, um, of Adams that basically said, yes, you can have your divorce, and her, again, her possible real thoughts. So um, let's get the letter and perform how we want it to be performed. These are your most excellent majesty to understand that I have been informed of the doubts which have been found in our marriage. It may please your majesty to know that, though this cause must needs be most hard and sorrowful unto me, for the great love which I bear your most noble person, I submit me to such examination and determination. And I acknowledge to put myself in my state and condition to your highness's goodness and pleasure, most humbly beseeching your majesty that, though it be determined the pretending matrimony between us is void and non effect, yet it will please you to take me for one of your humble servants, and that your highness will take me for your sister, for which I must probably thank you accordingly. Thus, most gracious prince, I beseech our Lord God to send you, your majesty, long life and good health, to God's glory, your own honour, and the wealth of this noble realm. Most noble prince, sister, I was brought to this country to be his wife and queen. Now what is the kind of thing? Who will marry me now? After the reports that the king was so gracious in sharing. He was weeping. I cannot go back to Germany, for I am in disgrace. And if I stay here, what then? I will never marry. I will never feel a man with more arms around me. Afraid of my child in my arms. If I am to survive, I must send this letter. I must 